447, chapters 64 and 65 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1030. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 447, Run Away! This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. <laughs> Referencing Monty Python and the Holy Grail, for those of you who like the Monty Pythonness, today's chapters include a, a little bit of the running away thing. So we have that to look forward to. I am about to take a couple of weeks break. So for those of you who are listening in real time, I apologize, but I will be traveling over the next couple of weeks and I am not going to be able to do any recording during that. So we will be looking forward to episode 448 on April 28th. We'll have our crafty chat that Tuesday on April 25th and on April 26th the 11th anniversary of the Craft Lit Podcast. Yes, 11 years. Uh, Justin and I will begin our brave new podcast. I will be giving you details and link information as to where you can either watch the live stream or watch the recording after we're done recording it. And the way that this podcast is going to work is we will host it on Patreon for the most part, But the first chapter of each book we will do as a live stream so you can get a feel for how the show is going to go and how we will talk about our books and how we will organize our books since these books are not in the public domain. So all of that will be dealt with in our first episode. And if you are on the Facebook group or if you follow Craftlet on Twitter or if you are on the Craftlet mailing list, you will get advance information on where and when to watch that live stream on April 26th. If you're not on the Craftlet mailing list, why? Get on it. I don't send out very many emails, so it won't be spammy at all. But that is the way that I can communicate with you the fastest if something comes up. Like if I have a new show coming up or if I suddenly can't record and I wanted to give you a heads up. That kind of information. All of that will go out in the mailing list email newsletter. There are links on the show notes at episode 447, craftlit.com slash 447. And that will include links to the mailing list and to the Facebook group and to the Twitter. And if you are new to the Craftlit podcast, I know there are several new listeners this week. Welcome. We are a little more than halfway through the Count of Monte Cristo. So if you want to start at the start of the book, go to episode 402. You can get there by going to craftlit.com slash 402, or you can download the app, which is a Craftlit specific app that you can get on the iTunes store, Google Play, Amazon, or from the Windows Marketplace for Windows 8 phones. The Craftlit app is dedicated. That means the only podcast it will play is Craftlit. It has all of the episodes loaded into it. That includes premium episodes. If you want to stream premium episodes through the phone or iPad or tablet app, you will have to sign in and sign up through that app. If the app gives you trouble, go to craftlit.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N, libsyn.com slash podcast. And you'll see a bar that goes across the middle of the screen when you open that page up and it says, get access to premium audio. If you sign up there, you're signing up through Libsyn. Libsyn is the company that built and maintains the app, the Craftlit app. So if you sign up there through them, you will get access both on that site and on the phone and tablet app to the premium audio as well, which is currently The Cat Came Back, a murder mystery, the second in the series by my husband. If you don't care about listening by app, you can go over to patreon.com slash craftlit and sign up to support the show there. And if you pledge $5 a month, you will get access to the premium audio 
over on Patreon. That allows you the opportunity to download the audio, which is something you cannot do from the Libsyn version. Okay, so episode 402, that's the beginning of our book. And if you are new to the podcast, the other big question that people tend to ask is, do I have to be crafty? And the answer is no, you don't. I mean, it's great if you are. And trust me, we're very good at enabling that kind of behavior from people. But if you are not crafty, I can pretty much be assured that you are at the very least busy. And busy people don't really have time to hold books, especially big books and old books and books that you know you should have read or that you read and you loved, but that you haven't had time to pick up again. And that is where the podcast comes in. So while you are puttering, vacuuming, doing dishes, driving carpools, gardening, washing the car, anything commuting, you have the opportunity to utilize this podcast to fill in that gap in your life, that gap that is crying out for classic literature, that wants really fun, interesting, layered, rich texts in your life. That's what this podcast is for. That's what it's about. And that is one of the reasons why we have a call in line. If you go to either the craftlit.com website and use the send feedback little tabby thing that pops up in the right hand edge of the screen, you can use that to send an audio file to me, which comes across sounding like a voicemail message. That's a little app that you can use either on your phone or on a computer as long as you have access to a microphone or some way to get sound into that system. If you would rather use a telephone, you can call area code 206-350-1642. That is a dedicated voicemail line that will send me an audio file of your message. And to show you how that works, here is a message from listener Paige. Here we go. Hi there, my name is Paige and I am calling from the hills of the Ozarks in Arkansas. And I just wanted to say how I thought this last chapter, the one about the apricots and the mice and the gardener and the telegraph thing was the most amazing single chapter I've ever read in my whole entire life, which seems like a big deal because that's, that's like a big statement, right? But it was just so beautiful and so... Like, it was just a movie running through my mind. And then I wanted, this like, kind of a weird aside, I wanted there to be a book solely about this telegraph guy and, like, what his life looked like after he passed out or before or something. I don't know. It was just a really interesting minor character for me. Anyways, really enjoying it. Can't wait to see where it goes. And hope you're having a great day. Bye. And Paige, I loved the telegraph operator too. And today in chapter 65, you'll get a little bit, the first part of an update on our, on our little gnomish <laughs> telegraph operator. He was a great character. On the Crafty Chat this week, on Tuesday, we showed lots of pictures from the Craft Literati group. If you are someone who has been able to join us for the live streams on Tuesdays at 1.30 at the Craftlit-Channel YouTube site, you may have heard that we have started a Craft Literati Facebook group. That's a place where if you are going to join in the conversation on the live stream chat, because we have a chat window that goes, so even if I don't have you visibly on screen with me, I can read out what you're saying, or sometimes bring you in on audio. If you have things to share, crafty things that you've been up to, load those pictures into the Craft Literati group on Facebook, and then I'll be able to pull from there and share what you have to show so people can see all of the cool things that all y'all are making. This week, one of the things that I shared was a tutorial that I found on how to convert a crew neck t-shirt into a v-neck t-shirt because my husband gave me a Burr 1800 <laughs> political t-shirt. For those of you who listen to Hamilton, you will know why that would be fun. The crew neck part was just a little too tight on me, and I was so distressed because I wanted to wear the shirt kind of all the time, and I couldn't. So links to how to convert a crew neck t-shirt to a v-neck t-shirt are to be found in the show notes 
both at creflit.com slash 447 and at youtube.com slash craftlit dash channel. So that's a dash like a hyphen, craftlit dash channel. And from there, you can get to a playlist of crafty chats. And those crafty chats include the one for episode 447. You'll be able to find links to the information on how to do the t-shirt conversion from there as well. Well, unlike the past few episodes, this week we do have some terminology that really hasn't popped up for a while, if at all. Uh, One of them was completely new to me. So in effort to make sure you aren't, you know, broadsided by stuff, a Landau is a horse-drawn four wheels enclosed carriage that had a removable front cover and one of those back covers that was like a a pram, like a a baby carriage so that you could uh, raise it or lower it and cover up the people who were in the back. So that's a Landau. That, of course, would be kind of expensive. Then there is a coupe, C-O-U-P-E with the accent on the E. This is a four-wheeled enclosed carriage for two people and a driver. So this holds fewer people, but is still quite nice. There is also a Tilbury, T-I-L-B-U-R-Y. This was a lightweight, open-aired, two-wheeled carriage. It's named for the inventor. Lightweight means it could go faster. It was a little bit more nimble, and it is not the kind of thing that most ladies would be driving. Unless you are the titular character in The Grand Sophie by Georgette Hare, which I read a little while ago and just cracked me up. And there is, in fact, a, I guess it's kind of a horse race late in the book, which was a lot of fun, especially because she had overtones of Marion Holcomb. So it's always fun when we get to see a little Marion from The Woman in White pop back up in another book. There is a Latin reference to Nil Amirari, which means uh, don't be impressed by anything. You could probably actually have guessed that one. The reason that I bring it up, aside from the fact that you could probably have figured it out, is that it's a little confusing pronoun-wise who that is referring to. That is referring to Papa Cavalcante. So Andrea Cavalcante's father, the major. So that's who that refers to. There's a reference to a facino or a Cicerone. Facino is porter and Cicerone, if you remember the time we spent in Rome, those are the people who would go around the, uh, in our case, around the Colosseum, uh, giving people tours, probably probably making stuff up randomly, just having a good time, making money. So Facino and Cicerone. And there is a new industry that I think we, we might be in the process of bringing back right now. It is called a clack, C-L-A-Q-U-E. These are people who are hired to go and listen to a speaker or a show, a theatrical show, ballet, anything like that, who are either hired to applaud at the appropriate time or hired to heckle at the appropriate time or inappropriate time, I guess. I did not know that this was a thing one could have been hired to do. And yet, clack. So there you are. And then finally, in chapter 65, there is nothing I need to give you a heads up on. It is all going to explain itself to you like butter. So let's hop to it. Chapters 64 and 65 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Here we go. Chapter 64. The Beggar. The evening passed on. Madame de Villefort expressed a desire to return to Paris which Madame Danglars had not dared to do, notwithstanding the uneasiness she experienced. On his wife's request, Monsieur de Villefort was the first to give the signal of departure. He offered a seat in his landau to Madame Danglars that she might be under the care of his wife. As for Monsieur Danglars, absorbed in an interesting conversation with Monsieur Cavalcanti, he paid no attention to anything that was passing. While Monte Cristo had begged the smelling bottle of Madame de Villefort, he had noticed the approach of Villefort to Madame Danglars, and he soon guessed all that had passed between them, 
though the words had been uttered in so low a voice as hardly to be heard by Madame Donglard. Without opposing their arrangements, he allowed Morel, Chateau Renaud, and de Bray to leave on horseback, and the ladies in Monsieur de Villefort's carriage. Donglard, more and more delighted with Major Cavalcanti, had offered him a seat in his carriage. Andrea Cavalcanti found his tilbury waiting at the door. The groom, in every respect, a caricature of the English fashion, was standing on tiptoe to hold a large iron grey horse. Andrea had spoken very little during the dinner. He was an intelligent lad, and he feared to utter some absurdity before so many grand people, amongst whom, with dilating eyes, he saw the king's attorney. Then he had been seized upon by Donglard, who, with a rapid glance at the stiff-necked old major and his modest son, and taking into consideration the hospitality of the count, made up his mind that he was in the society of some nabob come to Paris to finish the worldly education of his heir. He contemplated with unspeakable delight the large diamond which shone on the major's little finger. For the major, like a prudent man, in case of any accident happening to his banknotes, had immediately converted them into an available asset. Then, after dinner, on the pretext of business, he questioned the father and son upon their mode of living, and the father and son previously informed that it was through Donglard, the one was to receive his 48,000 francs, and the other 50,000 livres annually, were so full of affability that they would have shaken hands even with the banker's servants. So much did their gratitude need an object to expend itself upon. One thing, above all the rest, heightened the respect, nay, almost the veneration of Donglard for Cavalcanti. The latter, faithful to the principle of Horace, nil admirari, had contented himself with showing his knowledge by declaring in what lake the best lampreys were caught. Then he had eaten some without saying a word more. Donglard, therefore, concluded that such luxuries were common at the table of the illustrious descendant of the Cavalcanti, who most likely in Lucca fed upon trout brought from Switzerland, and lobsters sent from England by the same means used by the Count to bring the lampreys from Lake Fusaro and the Stelet from the Volga. Thus it was, with much politeness of manner, that he heard Cavalcanti pronounce these words. "'Tomorrow, sir,' I shall have the honour of waiting upon you on business. And I, sir, said Donglar, shall be most happy to receive you. Upon which he offered to take Cavalcanti in his carriage to the Hôtel des Princes, if it would not be depriving him of the company of his son. To this Cavalcanti replied by saying that for some time past his son had lived independently of him, that he had his own horses and carriages, and that not having come together, it would not be difficult for them to leave separately. The major seated himself, therefore, by the side of Donglar, who was more and more charmed with the ideas of order and economy which ruled this man, and yet who, being able to allow his son sixty thousand francs a year, might be supposed to possess a fortune of five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand livres. As for Andrea... He began by way of showing off to scold his groom, who, instead of bringing the tilbury to the steps of the house, had taken it to the outer door, thus giving him the trouble of walking thirty steps to reach it. The groom heard him with humility, took the bit of the impatient animal with his left hand, and with the right held out the reins to Andrea, who, taking them from him, rested his polished boot lightly on the step. At that moment, a hand touched his shoulder. The young man turned round, thinking that Donglard or Monte Cristo had forgotten something they wished to tell him, and had returned just as they were starting. But instead of either of these, he saw nothing but a strange face, sunburnt and encircled by a beard, with eyes brilliant as carbuncles, and a smile upon the mouth which displayed a perfect set of white teeth, pointed and sharp as the wolf's or jackal's. A red handkerchief encircled his grey head. Torn and filthy garments covered his large bony limbs, which seemed as though, like those of a skeleton, they would rattle as he walked. 
and the hand with which he leaned upon the young man's shoulder, and which was the first thing Andrea saw, seemed of gigantic size. Did the young man recognise that face by the light of the lantern in his tilbury? Or was he merely struck with the horrible appearance of his interrogator? We cannot say, but only relate the fact that he shuddered and stepped back suddenly. What do you want of me? he asked. Pardon me, my friend, if I disturb you, said the man with the red handkerchief. But I want to speak to you. You have no right to beg at night, said the groom, endeavouring to rid his master of the troublesome intruder. I am not begging, my fine fellow, said the unknown to the servant, with so ironical an expression of the eye, and so frightful a smile that he withdrew. I only wish to say two or three words to your master, who gave me a commission to execute about a fortnight ago. Come, said Andrea, with sufficient nerve for his servant not to perceive his agitation. What do you want? Speak quickly, friend. The man said in a low voice, I wish... I wish you to spare me the walk back to Paris. I am very tired, and as I have not eaten so good a dinner as you, I can scarcely stand. The young man shuddered at this strange familiarity. Tell me, he said, tell me what you want. Well then, I want you to take me up in your fine carriage and carry me back. Andrea turned pale but said nothing. Yes said the man, thrusting his hands into his pockets and looking impudently at the youth. I have taken the whim into my head. Do you understand, Master Benedetto? At this name, no doubt, the young man reflected a little, for he went towards his groom, saying, This man is right. I did indeed charge him with a commission, the result of which he must tell me. Walk to the barrier there, take a cab, that you may not be too late." The surprised groom retired. "'Let me at least reach a shady spot,' said Andrea. "'Oh, as for that, I'll take you to a splendid place,' said the man with the handkerchief. And taking the horse's bit, he led the tilbury where it was certainly impossible for anyone to witness the honour that Andrea conferred upon him. "'Don't think I want the glory of riding in your fine carriage,' said he. Oh, no, it's only because I am tired, and also because I have a little business to talk over with you. Come, step in, said the young man. It was a pity this scene had not occurred in daylight, for it was curious to see this rascal throwing himself heavily down on the cushion beside the young and elegant driver of the Tilbury. Andrea drove past the last house in the village without saying a word to his companion, who smiled complacently, as though well pleased to find himself travelling in so comfortable a vehicle. Once out of Auteuil, Andrea looked around in order to assure himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and then, stopping the horse and crossing his arms before the man, he asked, Now, tell me why you come to disturb my tranquillity. Let me ask you why you deceived me. How have I deceived you? How, do you ask, when we parted at the Pont du Var, you told me you were going to travel through Piedmont and Tuscany, but instead of that, you come to Paris. How does that annoy you? It does not. On the contrary, I think it will answer my purpose. So, said Andrea, you are speculating upon me? What fine words he uses! I warn you, Master Caderousse, that you are mistaken. Well, well, don't be angry, my boy. You know well enough what it is to be unfortunate, and misfortunes make us jealous. I thought you were earning a living in Tuscany or Piedmont by acting as Facino or Cicerone, and I pitied you sincerely as I would a child of my own. You know I always did call you my child." Come, come, what then? Patience, patience. I am patient, but go on. All at once, 
I see you pass through the barrier with a groom, a tilbury, and fine new clothes. You must have discovered a mine, or else become a stockbroker. So that, as you confess, you are jealous. No, I am pleased. So pleased that I wished to congratulate you. But as I am not quite properly dressed, I chose my opportunity that I might not compromise you. Yes, and a fine opportunity you have chosen, exclaimed Andrea. You speak to me before my servant. How can I help that, my boy? I speak to you when I can catch you. You have a quick horse, a light tilbury. You are naturally as slippery as an eel. If I had missed you tonight, I might not have had another chance. You see, I do not conceal myself. You are lucky. I wish I could say as much, for I do conceal myself. And then I was afraid you would not recognize me, but you did, added Caderousse with his unpleasant smile. It was very polite of you. Come, said Andrea, what do you want? You do not speak affectionately to me, Benedetto, my old friend. That is not right. Take care or I may become troublesome. This menace smothered the young man's passion. He urged the horse again into a trot. You should not speak so to an old friend like me, Caderousse. As you said just now, you are a native of Marseille. I am... Do you know, then, now what you are? No, but I was brought up in Corsica. You are old and obstinate. I am young and willful. Between people like us, threats are out of place. Everything should be amicably arranged. Is it my fault if fortune which has frowned on you has been kind to me? Fortune has been kind to you then. Your tilbury, your groom, your clothes are not then hired. Good. So much the better, said Caderousse, his eyes sparkling with avarice. Oh, you well know that well enough before speaking to me, said Andrea, becoming more and more excited. If I had been wearing a handkerchief like yours on my head, rags on my back and worn-out shoes on my feet, you would not have known me. You wrong me, my boy. Now I have found you. Nothing prevents my being as well dressed as any one, knowing as I do the goodness of your heart. If you have two coats, you will give me one of them. I used to divide my soup and beans with you when you were hungry. True, said Andrea. What an appetite you used to have. Is it as good now? Oh, yes, replied Andrea, laughing. How did you come to be dining with that prince whose house you have just left? He is not a prince, simply a count. A count, and a rich one too, eh? Yes, but you had better not have anything to say to him, for he is not a very good-tempered gentleman. Oh, be easy. I have no design upon your count, and you shall have him all to yourself, but, said Caderousse, again smiling, with a disagreeable expression he had before assumed, you must pay for it, you understand? Well, what do you want? I think that with a uh, hundred francs a month, well, I could live upon a hundred francs. Come, you understand me, but that with, with, with a hundred and fifty francs, I could be quite happy. Here are two hundred, said Andrea, and he placed ten gold louis in the hand of Caderousse. Good said Caderousse. Apply to the steward on the first day of every month, and you will receive the same sum. There now, again you degrade me. How so? By making me apply to your servants, when I want to transact business with you alone. Well, be it so, then. Take it from me, then. And so long, at least, as I receive my income, you shall be paid yours. Come, come. I always said you were a fine fellow, 
and it is a blessing when good fortune happens to such as you. But tell me all about it. Why do you wish to know? asked Cavalcanti. What? Do you again defy me? No, the fact is I have found my father. What? A real father? Yes, so long as he pays me. You'll honor and believe him? That's right. What is his name? Major Cavalcanti. Is he pleased with you? So far I have appeared to answer his purpose. And who found his father for you? The Count of Monte Cristo. The man whose house you have just left? Yes. I wish you would try and find me a situation with him as grandfather, since he holds the money chest. Well, I will mention you to him. Meanwhile, what are you going to do? I? Yes, you. It is very kind of you to trouble yourself about me. Since you interest yourself in my affairs, I think it is now my turn to ask you some questions. Ah, true. Well, I shall rent a room in some respectable house, wear a decent coat, shave every day, and go and read the papers in a café. Then in the evening I shall go to the theatre. I shall look like uh, some retired baker. That is what I want. Come, if you will only put the scheme into execution, and be steady, nothing could be better. And do you think so, Monsieur Boussouet? And you, what will you become? A peer of France? Ah, said Andrea, who knows? Major Cavalcanti is already one, perhaps, but then hereditary rank is abolished. No politics, Caderousse. And now that you have all you want, and that we understand each other, jump down from the Tilbury and disappear. Not at all, my good friend. How? Not at all. Why, just think for a moment. With this red handkerchief on my head, with scarcely any shoes, no papers, and ten gold Napoleons in my pocket, without reckoning what was there before, making in all about two hundred francs, why I should certainly be arrested at the barrier. Then, to justify myself, I should say that you gave me the money. This would cause inquiries. It would be found out that I left too long without giving due notice, and I should then be escorted back to the shores of the Mediterranean. Then I should become simply numero 106, and goodbye to my dream of resembling the retired baker. No, no, my boy. I prefer remaining honorably in the capital. Andreas scowled. Certainly, as he had himself owned, the reputed son of Major Cavalcanti was a willful fellow. He drew up for a minute, threw a rapid glance around him, and then his hand fell instantly into his pocket, where it began playing with a pistol. But, meanwhile, Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off his companion, passed his hand behind his back and opened a long Spanish knife, which he always carried with him, to be ready in case of need. The two friends, as we see, were worthy of and understood each other. Andrea's hand left his pocket inoffensively and was carried up to the red moustache, which it played with for some time. "'Good Calarus,' he said. "'How happy you will be!' "'I will do my best.' said the innkeeper of the Pont du Gard, shutting up his knife. Well, then, we will go into Paris. But how will you pass through the barrier without exciting suspicion? It seems to me that you are in more danger riding than on foot. Wait, said Caderousse. We shall see. He then took the great coat with the large collar which the groom had left behind in the Tilbury and put it on his back. Then he took off Calvacanti's hat, which he placed upon his own head, and finally he assumed the careless attitude of a servant whose master drives himself. "'But tell me,' said Andrea, "'am I to remain bareheaded?' "'Poor,' said Calrus, "'it is so windy that your hat can easily appear to have blown off.' "'Come, come, enough of this,' said Cavalcanti. 
What are you waiting for? said Caderousse. I hope I am not the cause. Hush, said Andrea. They passed the barrier without accident. At the first cross street, Andrea stopped his horse, and Caderousse leapt out. Well, said Andrea, my servant's coat and my hat. Ah, said Caderousse, you would not like me to risk taking cold. But what am I to do? You? Oh, you are young. Well, I am beginning to get old. Au revoir, Benedetto. And running into a court, he disappeared. Alas, said Andrea, sighing, one cannot be completely happy in this world. End of chapter 64 Chapter 65 A Conjugal Scene At the Place Louis XV, the three young people separated. That is to say, Morel went to the boulevard, Chateau Renaud to the Pont de la Révolution, and Debray to the Quai. Most probably Morel and Chateau Renaud returned to their domestic hearths, as they say in the gallery of the chamber, in well-turned speeches, and in the theatre of the Rue Richelieu, in well-written pieces. But it was not the case with Debray. When he reached the wicket of the Louvre, he turned to the left, galloped across the carousel, passed through the Rue Saint-Roche, and, issuing from the Rue de la Michaudière, he arrived at Monsieur Danglars' door, just at the same time that Villefort's Landau, after having deposited him and his wife at the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, stopped to leave the Baroness at her own house. Debray, with the air of a man familiar with the house, entered first into the court, threw his bridle into the hands of a footman, and returned to the door to receive Madame Danglars, to whom he offered his arm to conduct her to her apartments. The gate once closed, and Debray and the Baroness alone in the court, he asked, "'What was the matter, Rudy Wermine? "'And why were you so affected at that story, "'or rather fable, which the Count related?' "'Because I have been in such shocking spirits "'all the evening, my friend,' said the Baroness. "'No, Hermine,' replied Debray. "'You cannot make me believe that. "'On the contrary, you were in excellent spirits "'when you arrived at the Count's. "'Monsieur Danglars was disagreeable, certainly.' But I know how much you care for this ill humour. Someone has vexed you. I will allow no one to annoy you. You are deceived, Lucien, I assure you, replied Madame Danglars, and what I have told you is really the case, added to the ill humour you remarked, but which I did not think it worth while to allude to. It was evident that Madame Danglars was suffering from that nervous irritability which women frequently cannot account for, even to themselves, or that, as de Bray had guessed, she had experienced some secret agitation that she would not acknowledge to any one. Being a man who knew that the former of these symptoms was one of the inherent penalties of womanhood, he did not then press his inquiries, but waited for a more appropriate opportunity, when he should again interrogate her, or receive an avowal proprio motu. At the door of her apartment, the baroness met Mademoiselle Cornélie, her confidential maid. "'What is my daughter doing?' asked Madame Danglars. "'She practised all the evening and then went to bed,' replied Mademoiselle Cornélie. "'Yet I think I hear her piano. "'It is Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly who is playing while Mademoiselle Danglars is in bed.' "'Well,' said Madame Danglars, "'come and undress me.' They entered the bedroom, Debray stretched himself upon a large couch, and Madame Danglars passed her into her dressing room with Mademoiselle Cornerly. My dear Monsieur Lucien, said Madame Danglars through the door, you are always complaining that Eugenie will not address a word to you. Madame, said Lucien, playing with a little dog, who recognized him as a friend of the house, expected to be caressed. I am not the only one who makes similar complaints. I think I heard Morcerf say that he could not extract a word from his betrothed. True, said Madame Danglars, yet I think this will all pass off, and that you will one day see her enter your study. My study? At least that of the minister. Why so? To ask for an engagement at the opera. 
Really, I never saw such an infatuation for music. It is quite ridiculous for a young lady of fashion. The Bray smiled. Well, said he, let her come with your consent and that of the Baron, and we will try and give her an engagement, though we are very poor to pay such talent as hers. Go, Corneli, said Madame Donglar. I do not require you any longer. Corneli obeyed, and the next minute Madame Donglar left her room in a charming loose dress, and came and sat down close to Dubray. Then she began thoughtfully to caress the little spaniel. Lucien looked at her for a moment in silence. Come, Hermine, he said. After a short time, answer candidly. Something vexes you. Is it not so? Nothing, answered the baroness. And yet, as she could scarcely breathe, she rose and went towards a looking glass. I am frightful to night, she said. De Bray rose, smiling, and was about to contradict the baroness upon this latter point when the door opened suddenly. Monsieur Donglas appeared. De Bray reseated himself. At the noise of the door, Madame Donglas turned around and looked upon her husband with an astonishment she took no trouble to conceal. Good evening, Madame, said the banker. Good evening, Monsieur de Bray. Probably the Baroness thought this unexpected visit signified a desire to make up for the sharp words he had uttered during the day. Assuming a dignified air, she turned round to de Bray without answering her husband. Read me something, Monsieur de Bray, she said. De Bray, who was slightly disturbed at this visit, recovered himself when he saw the calmness of the Baroness and took up a book marked by a mother-of-pearl knife inlaid with gold. "'Excuse me,' said the banker, "'but you will tie yourself, Baroness, by such late hours, "'and Monsieur de Bray lives some distance from here.' De Bray was petrified, not only to hear Donglas speak so calmly and politely, but because it was apparent that beneath outward politeness there really lurked a determined spirit of opposition to anything his wife might wish to do. The Baroness was also surprised, and showed her astonishment by a look which would doubtless have had some effect upon her husband, if he had not been intently occupied with the paper, where he was looking to see the closing stock quotations. The result was that the proud look entirely failed of its purpose. "'Monsieur Lucien,' said the Baroness, I assure you, I have no desire to sleep, and that I have a thousand things to tell you this evening, which you must listen to even though you slept while hearing me. I am at your service, madame, replied Lucien coldly. My dear Monsieur de Bray, said the banker, do not kill yourself tonight, listening to the follies of Madame Donglar, for you can hear them as well tomorrow. But I claim tonight and will devote it, if you will allow me, to talk over some serious matters with my wife. This time the blow was so well aimed, and hit so directly, that Lucien and the Baroness were staggered, and they interrogated each other with their eyes, as if to seek help against his aggression. But the irresistible will of the master of the house prevailed, and the husband was victorious. "'Do not think I wish to turn you out, my dear de Bray, continued Donglar. "'Oh, no, not at all. An unexpected occurrence forces me to ask my wife to have a little conversation with me. It is so rarely I make such a request. I am sure you cannot grudge it to me.' De Bray muttered something, bowed, and went out, knocking himself against the edge of the door, like Nathan in Atalie. It is extraordinary, he said when the door was closed behind him, how easily these husbands, whom we ridicule, gain an advantage over us. Lucien having left, Danglars took his place on the sofa, closed the open book, and placing himself in a dreadfully dictatorial attitude, he began playing with the dog, but the animal not liking him as well as de Bray, and attempting to bite him. Donglar seized him by the skin of his neck and threw him upon a couch on the other side of the room. The animal uttered a cry during the transit, 
but arrived at its destination. It crouched behind the cushions and, stupefied at such unusual treatment, remained silent and motionless. "'Do you know, sir,' asked the baroness, "'that you are improving? Generally you are only rude, but to-night you are brutal.' "'It is because I am in a worse humour than usual,' replied Danglars. Hermine looked at the banker with supreme disdain. These glances frequently exasperated the pride of Danglars, but this evening he took no notice of them. "'And what have I to do with your ill humour? said the Marioness, irritated at the impassibility of her husband. "'Do these things concern me?' Keep your ill humour at home in your money-boxes, or, since you have clerks whom you pay, vent it upon them. Not so, replied Danglars. Your advice is wrong, so I shall not follow it. My money-boxes are my patolos, as I think Monsieur de Moustier says, and I will not retard its course, or disturb its calm. My clerks are honest men, who earn my fortune my pay much below their deserts, if I may value them according to what they bring in. Therefore I shall not get into a passion with them, those with whom I will be in a passion, or those who eat my dinners, mount my horses, and exhaust my fortune. And pray, who are the persons who exhaust your fortune? Explain yourself more clearly, I beg, sir. Oh, make yourself easy. I am not speaking riddles, and you will soon know what I mean. The people who exhaust my fortune are those who draw out seven hundred thousand francs in the course of an hour. I do not understand you, sir, said the baroness, trying to disguise the agitation of her voice and the flush of her face. You understand me perfectly. "'On the contrary,' said Danglars. "'But if ye will persist, I will tell you that I have just lost seven hundred thousand francs upon the Spanish loan.' "'And pray,' asked the baroness, "'am I responsible for this loss?' "'Why not?' "'Is it my fault you have lost seven hundred thousand francs?' "'Certainly it is not mine.' "'Once for all, sir,' replied the baroness sharply. "'I tell you I will not hear cash named. It is a style of language I never heard in the house of my parents or in that of my first husband.' "'Oh, I can well believe that, for neither of them was worth a penny.' "'The better reason for my not being conversant with the slang of the bank, which is here dinning in my ears from morning to night.' That noise of jingling crowns, which are constantly being counted and recounted, is odious to me. I only know one thing I dislike more, which is the sound of your voice. Really, said Danglars, well, this surprises me, for I thought you took the liveliest interest in all my affairs. Why, what could put such an idea into your head? Yourself? Ah, what next? Most assuredly. I should like to know upon what occasion. Oh, mon Dieu, that is very easily done. Last February you were the first who told me of the Haitian funds. You had dreamed that a ship had entered the harbour at Havre, that this ship brought news that a payment we had looked upon as lost was going to be made. I know how clear-sighted your dreams are, I therefore purchased immediately as many shares as I could of the Haitian debt, and I gained four hundred thousand francs by it, of which one hundred thousand have been honestly paid to you. You spent it as you pleased. That was your business. In March there was a question about a grant to a railway. Three companies presented themselves, each offering equal securities. You told me that your instinct, and although you pretend to know nothing about speculations, I think on the contrary that your comprehension is very clear upon certain affairs. Well, you told me that your instinct led you to believe the grant would be given 
to the company called The Southern. I bought two-thirds of the shares of that company. As you had foreseen, the shares trebled in value and I picked up a million, from which 250,000 francs were paid to you for pin money. How have you spent this 250,000 francs? It is no business of mine. When are you coming to the point? cried the baroness, shivering with anger and impatience. Patience, madame. I am coming to it. That's fortunate. In April you went to dine at the minister's. You had a private conversation respecting Spanish affairs and the expulsion of Don Carlos. I bought some Spanish shares. The expulsion took place and I pocketed 600,000 francs the day Charles V repassed the Bidar Soa. Of those 600,000 francs, you took 50,000 crowns. They were yours. You disposed of them according to your fancy, and I ask no questions. But it is not the less true that you have this year received 500,000 livres. Well, sir, and what then? Ah, yes, it was just after this that you spoiled everything. Really? Your manner of speaking... It expresses my meaning, and that is all I want. Well, three days after that you talked politics with Monsieur de Bray, and you fancied from his words that Don Carlos had returned to Spain. Well, I sold my shares. The news got out, and I no longer sold. I gave them away. Next day I find the news was false, and by this false report I have lost 700,000 francs. Well? Well, since I gave you a fourth of my gains, I think you owe me a fourth of my losses. The fourth of 700,000 francs is 175,000 francs. What you say is absurd, and I cannot see why Monsieur Dobre's name is mixed up in this affair. Because, if you do not possess the 175,000 francs I reclaim, you must have lent them to your friends, and Monsieur Dobre is one of your friends. For shame! exclaimed the baroness. Oh, let us have no gestures, no screams, no modern drama, or you will oblige me to tell you that I see the Ray leave here, pocketing the whole of the 500,000 livres you have handed over to him this year, while he smiles to himself, saying that he has found what the most skilful players have never discovered, that is, a roulette where he wins without playing, and is no loser when he loses. The baroness became enraged. Wretch, she cried, will you dare to tell me you did not know what you now reproach me with? I do not say that I did know it, and I do not say that I did not know it. I merely tell you to look into my conduct during the last four years that we have ceased to be husband and wife, and see whether it has not always been consistent. Some time after our rupture, you wish to study music under the celebrated baritone who made such a successful appearance at the Theatre Italien. At the same time, I felt inclined to learn dancing of the dancers who acquired such a reputation in London. This cost me, on your account and mine, one hundred thousand francs. I said nothing, for we must have peace in the house, and one hundred thousand francs for a lady and gentleman to be properly instructed in music and dancing are not too much. Well, you soon became tired of singing, and you take a fancy to study diplomacy with the minister's secretary. You understand it signifies nothing to me so long as you pay for your lessons out of your own cash box. But today I find you are drawing on mine, and that your apprenticeship 
may cost me seven hundred thousand francs per month. Stop there, madame, for this cannot last. Either the diplomatist must give his lessons gratis, and I will tolerate him, or he must never set his foot again in my house. Do you understand, madame? Oh, this is too much, cried Amine, choking. You are worse than despicable. But, continued Danglars, I find you did not even pause there. Insults! You are right. Let us leave these facts alone and reason coolly. I have never interfered in your affairs, excepting for your good. Treat me in the same way. You say you have nothing to do with my cash-box. Be it so. Do as you like with your own, but do not fill or empty mine. Besides, how do I know that this was not a political trick, that the minister enraged at seeing me in the opposition, and jealous of the popular sympathy I excite, has not concerted with Monsieur de Bray to ruin me? A probable thing. Why not? Who ever heard of such an occurrence as this? A false telegraphic dispatch. It is almost impossible for wrong signals to be made as they were in the last two telegrams. It was done on purpose for me. I am sure of it. Sir, said the baroness humbly, are you not aware that the man employed there was dismissed? That they talked of going to law with him? That orders were issued to arrest him, and that this order would have been put into execution if he had not escaped by flight, which proves that he is either mad or guilty? It was a mistake. Yes, which made fools laugh, which caused the minister to have a sleepless night, which has caused the minister's secretaries to blacken several sheets of paper, by which has cost me seven hundred thousand francs. But, sir, said Amine suddenly, if all this is, as you say, caused by Monsieur Topré, why, instead of going direct to him, do you come and tell me of it? Why, to accuse the man, do you address the woman? Do I know Monsieur Debré? Do I wish to know him? Do I wish to know that he gives advice? Do I wish to follow it? Do I speculate? No. You do all this, not I. Still, it seems to me that as you profit by it... Danglars shrugged his shoulders. Foolish creature, he exclaimed. Women fancy they have talent because they have managed two or three intrigues without being the talk of Paris. But know that if you had even hidden your irregularities from your husband, who was but the commencement of the art, for generally husbands will not see, you would then have been but a faint imitation of most of your friends among the women of the world. But it has not been so with me. I see, and always have seen, during the last sixteen years, you may perhaps have hidden a thought, but not a step, not an action, not a fault has escaped me. While you flattered yourself upon your address and firmly believed you had deceived me, what has been the result? That, thanks to my pretended ignorance, there is none of your friends, from Monsieur de Villefort to Monsieur de Bray, who has not trembled before me. There is not one who has not treated me as the master of the house, the only title I desire with respect to you. There is not one, in fact, who would have dared to speak of me as I have spoken of them this day. I will allow you to make me hateful, but I will prevent you rendering me ridiculous, and above all, I forbid you to ruin me. The baroness had been tolerably composed until the name of Villefort had been pronounced. But then she became pale. 
and rising as if touched by a spring, she stretched out her hands as though conjuring in an apparition. She then took two or three steps towards her husband, as though to tear the secret from him of which she was ignorant, or which he withheld from some odious calculation, odious as all his calculations were. Monsieur de Villefort, what do you mean? I mean that Monsieur de Nargonne, your first husband, being neither a philosopher nor a banker, or perhaps being both and seeing there was nothing to be got out of a king's attorney, died of grief or anger at finding, after an absence of nine months, that you had been enceinte cease. I am brutal. I not only allow it, but boast of it. It is one of the reasons of my success in commercial business. Why did he kill himself instead of you? Because he had no cash to save. My life belongs to my cash. Monsieur Dobre has made me lose 700,000 francs. Let him bear his share of the loss, and we will go on as before. If not, let him become bankrupt for the 250,000 livres, and do as all bankrupts do, disappear. He is a charming fellow, I allow, when his news is correct. But when it is not, there are fifty others in the world who would do better than he. Madame Danglars was rooted to the spot. She made a violent effort to reply to this last attack, but she fell upon a chair, thinking of Villefort, of the dinner scene, of the strange series of misfortunes which had taken place in her house during the last few days, and changed the usual calm of her establishment to a scene of scandalous debate. Danglars did not even look at her, though she did her best to faint. He shut the bedroom door after him, without adding another word, and returned to his apartments. And when Madame Danglars recovered from her half-fainting condition, she could almost believe that she had had a disagreeable dream. End of chapter 65 So I think I can say without fear of contradiction, without too much fear of contradiction, don't Danglar and Madame Danglar appear to deserve each other? Wow. I mean, the surprises for me anyway, the surprises for me kept coming in this chapter. The fact that Danglar walked in on Debray and the Madame, and then every single thing that happened after that, up to and including the very last revelation that he knew her big secret. And it seems he's known it for a really long time. I... This feels like a very modern scene or twist. The kind that you would see on a, a TV show on HBO these days. I was, I was stupefied by that. And on the other end of the spectrum, at the beginning of chapter 65, I was kind of surprised by having Alexandre Dumas basically go in and say, oh, perhaps she's having female trouble. And Dubray, having been around the block several times, knew that it was really, <laughs> it was really pointless to argue at this point. <laughs> it reminded me of that Ben Fold song. Oh, I can't remember which song it was, where he talks about waking up in the morning and his girlfriend or his wife was angry at him for something that he did in a dream the night before, which is absurd, but it happens. And again, when things like that happen, you just smile and back away. <laughs> Don't engage with that conversation. It's not going to turn out well for anybody. But I, I, I was both surprised and impressed by Dumas' modernity at that point. Remembering again that this is before Dickens was writing. So we're in a French book. <laughs> uh, who knew? And then in the preceding chapter, working backwards as we are, Caderousse is back. And Caderousse is, he's playing smart now. Having not, not been the sharpest knife in the drawer before, he appears to be at least playing Benedetto slash Andrea Cavalcante pretty well and, and being successful at it so far. And it, was, it wasn't really the honor amongst thieves thing that we saw between Edmond Dantes when he was first out of the Chateau d'If, 
but but there is a a language that is shared between Caderus and Andrea slash Benedetto. And and they they kind of have a meeting of the minds. They understand each other. And I was kind of surprised and then not at all surprised as I thought about it more that Andrea's response was, okay, you're asking for 150. I'm going to give you 200. And every month, beginning of the month, you show up and I'll pay you off. And at first I thought, oh, why would he do that? He's, he's not that kind of person. And then I thought, oh no, he's exactly that kind of person because he knows what trouble Caterus would make if he didn't pay him. And if he didn't pay him the 200 to start, Caterus is going to come back at some point and ask for 200 and make a big deal out of it anyway. So meh, meh, may as well. They had a, uh, they have a very interesting relationship. Oh, and for Paige in Chapter 65, we did hear about our telegraph operator and that he escaped, which to Madame Danglar makes it obvious that he was guilty, while to us, we know that, well, yes, he was guilty, but not of his own choice in doing wrong, or not, I guess it was his choice to do it. It wasn't his idea initially to do this thing. Instead, he was being paid, and it appears to me that once suspicion started being thrown his direction, Monte Cristo must have stepped in and gotten him out of there. I didn't get the sense that the telegraph operator would necessarily have known how to perpetrate a really swift and silent escape, effective escape. So my my mind just went to, oh, well, the Count must have gotten him out of there because he wants to do right by the people who do right by him. and. That's one of the people who did an important service for him, an important service in the process of getting back at Danglar. So now we have had very actively one hit on Danglar, lost him a lot of money, and we've had one emotional hit on Viafor with the, the dinner party where the story of the baby was exposed. Now, does Benedetto know anything about the baby? No, apparently he has not connected those dots, but we know that Bertuccio did. So that's going to be interesting to watch as we go forward from here. We have one last voicemail that I wanted to play for you. This is from Sarah, and she refers back to chapter 59, which, if you recall, talked about how Valentin and Noitier were able to communicate with each other. And I think I mentioned that there must have been something that. Dumas had witnessed or heard about or read about where some of, someone had come up with a system for how to communicate with a stroke victim. Uh, she also said that this was called locked-in syndrome, and I will let her tell you the really cool bit beyond that. Here we go. Here's Sarah. Hi, Heather. This is Sarah, Sarah Dempson on Ravelry, and I have never called or written in, although I have been an avid listener for at least four years. I always enjoy learning from what others share, and this time it's my turn to add to the conversation. I've been behind on the count for weeks, but finally caught up just in time to be totally excited about Chapter 59. As I was listening to the description of Moitier and Valentin's communication, my jaw was dropping. I can't believe no one has called in or written about the exploding field of what is now called alternative and augmentative communication. I am a speech-language pathologist, and AAC was one of my major interests throughout school and once I began practicing speech therapy with young children, especially with those who have cerebral palsy. What Noitier specifically has is locked-in syndrome, which is exactly what it sounds like. This really does occur in cases of severe stroke or brain trauma. There are now many communication options for someone who has higher cognitive functioning than their motor skills allow for. Or what if speech is impaired, but hand movements can be captured and trained to select options? from the alphabet or other choices on a tablet or other device. Some of the most fascinating work is being done in this area. It makes me really happy to think of the outlet that communication can provide for someone who might sadly be dismissed otherwise as unreachable or unrelatable. I think Dumas is way ahead of his time here, and I agreed with you that he must have known of someone somewhere doing this already. It's now turned into a whole branch of study that includes several graduate-level classes in most universities for speech therapists. Nautier was so lucky to have Valentin and her patients. His existence would have been tragic without her. Anyway, I'll send an email with a link to a great page for anyone who is interested in learning more about augmentative communication. Thanks so much for all the work you do for Craplet, Heather. I've benefited so much from it over the years. Have a great day. Right? How cool is that? 
I know. I said somebody's going to know. Some genius person who listens to the podcast is going to be able to call in and tell us all about it. And here comes Sarah. So yay. Thank you, Sarah. She also sent me a link that I have put into the show notes if you want to look more into this particular form, theory, philosophy, process by which you can communicate with somebody who has lost uh, speech and movement. And uh, I read through some of the website. It is a professional website. It's one that she said she trusts. It's probably not the easiest one to understand, but I have a hard time believing that anyone who listens to Craftlet would have too much trouble following the basic gist of the site. And I think once you know the terminology, if you are, for example, someone who is related to someone who is in a situation like this, who has suffered a stroke or some other kind of debilitating, uh, taken a debilitating hit, I think the benefit of this website, the big benefit of this website is that once you take a look at it, you will know the terminology. You'll have the language to go and research more in that same arena and not waste your time finding stuff that isn't helpful. You will only be locating support and resources that actually fit the situation that you find yourself in. So thank you, Sarah, so much for doing that and, and listening for so long and calling in and sharing that information with all of us. I, I know that is an important resource for many. I also wanted to take a moment to thank our new patrons. We have two from March. We have Lily M and Kate W. Thank you so much for your support of the Craftlet podcast. I continue to make changes over at the Patreon site. It's a very odd format, and it's it's really not built for weekly podcasts or anything remotely like that. It's for people who, you know, once every six weeks put up a video, or they're an artist, and they have uh, things that you can watch them do, like drawing. They can do a speed film, a speed video of them drawing something. And that all makes a lot of sense. But for you to see a behind-the-scenes video of me podcasting, I don't think you'd want to see it. <laughs> oh, look, it's Heather in sweats with her hair up on top of her head. That's awesome. And the way I record, there isn't even really a blooper reel. So maybe Justin and I'll come up with something for the 1984 Brave New Podcast podcast, because that will be recorded differently. And I anticipate there will be blooper reels between the two of us. And Justin can break in here <laughs> and let you know what he thinks as well. But I'm very much looking forward to doing that. So the upshot of all of that is if you have suggestions or requests or things that you would like or like to have access to or like to see over on the Patreon site offered as a perk for being a supporter of this now almost 11 year running podcast, please, please, please feel free to hit the little message button. Send me a request. You can send me email at heather at craftlit.com. You can get on the mailing list. You can hit me up on Facebook. I am right now during tax season, not very frequently on social media, but I do loop around every so often and try to respond as I can. So I am off on a trip once again, and then I will be back. And at the end of April, we will move on with the next chunk of the Count of Monte Cristo. I hope you have a great couple of weeks. Enjoy your spring, your Passover, your Easter, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Take care. Have a great one. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 